any photo shoot of a landscape is at the mercy of weather. I am not an advocate of gloomy photographs. Moody, yes, and whilst I would not always wish for a full frontal, in-your-face blue sky, there are many variations in between that will enhance a landscape photograph. Getting it right takes a lot of skill outside photo technique and best accomplished on your own. Furthermore, you might possess a skill second to none, but that goes out of the window if weather decides not to play ball and do the dirty. February might not be the first choice for landscape photography in the UK, but Throwing caution to the four winds, I planned a three-night break based at Chepstow to explore on foot the Wye Valley. To take advantage of the best deals, I did not make matters any easier by booking accommodation and travel at least two months in advance. A glance at the Ordnance Survey map reveals that the Wye Valley is deep and heavily wooded. This could be a problem in high summer for views, less so in winter. The Offersdyke Path, which runs 177 miles along the Welsh border from Chepstow to Prestatyn, initially takes a high level traverse above the Wye Valley, which I followed to Tinton. Founded in 1131, the monastic buildings expanded in the first half of the 13th century and consecrated in 1301. With the Black Death and Welsh Uprising, matters were not always peaceful, only to be suppressed by Henry VIII in 1536. It lay forgotten until the 18th century, when it was romanticised by artists and poets that included Turner and Wordsworth. Today we revel in its history and romance. Much of this may not seem important to the photographer, but it adds that third dimension to a scene that explains the whys and wherefores. I very nearly committed a cardinal error by arriving from my offer's dyke walk from Chepstow too late, forgetting that the steep-sided valley would soon obscure the winter sun's rays, or made worse by stopping first for coffee and a muffin. Fortunately, the Almighty remained on my side, the late afternoon sun now adding its own magic to a scene that gently evoked its more serene past. Even though the dying rays of a late afternoon February sun is less intense, balancing exposure between highlights and shadows is still a challenge. Even with raw files, preventing highlights from overexposure is problematic and difficult to correct in post-production. At the risk of noise, I underexpose by spot metering from a highlight and correct in Lightroom with black and shadow sliders. On a long walk I travel light, so I am unlikely to take a tripod for HDR. But modern sensors seem to be more tolerant to noise, and anyway it could be argued that some noise adds to the magic and mystery of a place like Tinton Abbey, whereas overexposed highlights destroy it. Error number two was almost committed the next day. 
I had a bee in my bonnet to visit Simmons Yat, a celebrated viewpoint that looks over the Wye Valley. The bus was taken to Monmouth, then Shanks's pony by the Wye for six miles. Wonderful walk, but travelling light, I was convinced that refreshment could be taken at Simmons Yat Rock. Wrong. So much for my research. Fortunately, my host had given me a hearty breakfast, but all I had for sustenance was a bar of Fry's Chocolate Cream Delight. Oh well, you have to suffer for your art in any way. I consoled myself with the thought that this twelve-mile walk was serving as my personal gym in the knowledge that the views were better, soon to be confirmed by the photographs. To add insult to injury, I got lost in woodland, trying to take a short cut. But salvation appeared like an oasis back at Chipster. It was curry night at Weatherspoons. Ah oh well, bang goes my diet and healthy lifestyle. I took it a bit easier the next day especially as I was travelling home on an advance first-class rail ticket, cheaper than buying a standard fare, incidentally, on the day. Nevertheless, I tackled the castle, St Mary's Church and Offersdyke Path again, this time but in the other direction from Chepstow to its start at Sedbury Cliffs. Having negotiated the convoluted urban splendours of Tuts Hill and Sedbury, the cliff scenery overlooking the River Severn was a pleasant scenic surprise. Again, after consulting the Ordnance Survey map, I decided that my arrival at Sedbury Cliffs should be as late as possible without missing the train home. The late afternoon light glamorised the muddy banks of the estuary, making the distant Severn road bridge look magical and inviting. Amazing how light improves an otherwise ordinary view influencing one's appreciation. It had clouded over at lunch. Time for another visit to Weatherspoons, followed by St Mary's Church. A church having Norman roots can be overpoweringly dark inside, and whilst our eyes take time to adjust to the gloom, a digital camera can expose correctly and instantly. However, sunlight streaming through windows will cause contrast difficulties, and a glorious stained glass window at the far end of the nave on the chancel is bound to be overexposed without a bit of traditional photographic knowledge. The technique is similar to Tintin, and whilst HDR could be used, the final image may not end up as a raw file. The ISO was increased to 400, the camera handheld with the help of the superior image stabiliser in my Olympus OMD camera. Also, an unexpected plus for Micro Four Thirds is extended depth of field, even at f4, allowing the foreground chairs to be sharp as well as the background. Therefore, against all the political odds to proceed correct photographic technique, these interior shots of St Mary's Church are handheld, spot metered off a highlight, contrast corrected in Lightroom, and the focusing set to the hyperfocal distance to increase depth of field. No filters, no tripod, and certainly not auto. Just the EM1 Mark II and a 12 to 100 lens, with Photoshop only used in the background to put back what no camera can record with complete accuracy. 
I never add something that was not there, even in the name of art. I prefer to give my audience a high degree of reality, but mindful that the technology still has limitations. But I don't make apologies for them. Remember, your eyes hopefully are better than any camera we can produce. You are wonderful, but cameras still need a bit of help. And then they too can be amazing with the right artist. Early February was a good time to visit the castle. I almost had it to myself. This is worth remembering for visits to stately homes that open their doors during winter, as well as castles and cathedrals which normally welcome visitors all year. The low level of light adds its own magic, but again creating difficulties for exposure control without unintentional overexposure of bright stonework. I was rather pleased that as you climbed to the far end of the castle, to the upper Barbican, the views back over the Wye extended to the old Wye Bridge. This cast iron bridge, constructed in 1816, crosses into Gloucestershire, England, from Monmouthshire, the national boundary following the river for several miles northwards between Wales and England. England. Photo trips of this nature, whether for one day or longer, require preparation and prior knowledge. It might be too much to expect more than one visit, but experience is beyond value. Certainly before leaving home, study maps and guidebooks. Something I do even a place where my own knowledge is extensive. There is always something new to learn. Once there, I travel light. I do not cart a load of gear around that I will probably not use. All photographs in this production were taken with the 12 to 100 lens, and I never felt restricted. When we discuss composition, the phrase less is more comes to mind, something that applies to the way I take photographs. On a shoot, I blend into the background, not advertising my presence. It is amazing what you can get away with by being incognito. In the end, I trust that it will be my photographs that will do the talking.